Recording and preserving the way people communicate is a key to understanding a culture. Media pioneer Tony Schwartz was born in 1923. He grew up near Peekskill, New York, and graduated from the Pratt Institute in 1944. A traumatic experience as a young boy left him blind for several weeks. It also left him with a case of agoraphobia, which has led him to limit his travels to his postal zone in Midtown, New York. Tony Schwartz has been recording the sounds of his neighborhood for more than 60 years. He began in 1945 when he purchased a WebCore wire recorder. A year later, he moved to tape. Some of his extensive acoustic images of New York City were converted into 19 phonograph albums for Folkways and Columbia Records. These recordings include one of conversations with New York City cab drivers. Another, called One, Two, Three, and Zing, 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 is of children's games of the streets. Not only was Tony Schwartz an audio documentarian, but he also incorporated the natural sounds of daily life into music. Photographer Edward Steichen called Schwartz the man who moved sound recording into the realm of the arts. Tony Schwartz was responsible for many songs that became popular. These included Merv Griffin's Everybody Loves Saturday Night, The Weaver's Weem Away, and the Banana Boat song by Harry Belafonte. It was very hard for black people and people who weren't white to get apartments in the city. And I would go rent them for this lady and then give them to people. And I gave this apartment to Harry Belafonte. And, uh, and then I gave him this this song, banana song, and he made a, a pop song of it. Mr. Schwartz, did you know Paul Robeson? Oh yes, I knew him well. I recorded him many times. Good morning. Today, I'd like to play two beautiful songs, sung by. Paul Robeson. I think he was one of the great singers of our time. In the McCarthy era, Robeson couldn't travel because they called him a communist, which is ridiculous. He wasn't a communist. He just believed in internationalism. He wanted to send tapes to various places around the world. One I did to send to England for a speech for him. It was about peace, so I had his song behind it. Then I had his narration over that. Peace and friendship with our great wartime ally, and enduring peace growing out of united, united nations, out of friendship with the Soviet people. I did it for many people who couldn't travel. For W.E.B. Du Bois, I would record speeches that he wanted to give in South Africa. Understanding the power of communication has been a key to persuasion in history. While collecting his cultural recordings, Tony Schwartz was working in advertising. He made commercials for popular products such as Alka-Seltzer and Coca-Cola. But even when working in television, Tony Schwartz understood the power of sounds that we hear. His ads are distinctive for their simplistic visuals. He was the first one to ever use real children's voices as opposed to adults imitating children. In 1963, Tony Schwartz was asked to work on the Johnson presidential campaign. He created the most effective and talked about political ad ever produced. I've been against nuclear weapons since 1939. One thing I've done was the daisy spot for President Johnson. I was working on sound for six or seven commercials in the campaign against Barry Goldwater. One of them was a little girl counting down and picking the petals off a daisy. Then there's the countdown. And then the bomb goes off. are the stakes. 
to make a world in which all of God's children can live or to go into the dark. We must either love each other or we must die. From that point on, Schwartz became the go-to man for major political campaigns. All of them trek to his door. He's got a little cubbyhole in New York <laughs> that he never leaves. He's had Carter there. He's had Teddy Kennedy there. All the look at this. Talk about power. You can you you shape public opinion. You decide who's going to run. After the Daisy ad. Tony Schwartz could command very large fees for his services, but his passion has always been public service. He will only work on a project that interests him for whatever they can afford to pay. As a result, he has forgone large fees for his priceless services. After his best friend was diagnosed with cancer in the 1960s, Tony Schwartz created the first anti-smoking public service ads. Children love to imitate their parents. Children learn by imitating their parents. Do you smoke cigarettes? The American Cancer Society credits these ads with the tobacco industries voluntarily taking cigarette ads off the air. Another public service ad with national impact was for the New York Fire Department. This ad was picked up and ran all over the country. And before the fire department gets there, the door. The rest of his house burns down. The door. Is there one single act that could have been done? Close the door. To help prevent this needless loss of life and property. Close the door. What should these people have done? Close the door. Do you know that a door is one of the best pieces of firefighting and life-saving equipment? Close the door. And if you leave a room that is on fire. Close the door. If you simply close the door. Close the door. It will help stop the fire and smoke from spreading too quickly. Media guru is a term often used to describe Tony Schwartz and Canadian theorist Marshall McLuhan. And while McLuhan is credited with many theories on communication, he went to Schwartz to discuss them. He called Schwartz a disciple with 20 years prior experience and the guru of the electronic age. Tony Schwartz wrote his own books. The Responsive Chord, published in 1973, quickly became a must-read for students of communication, as well as those in the advertising business. The Responsive Chord was followed ten years later by Media, the Second God. It also becomes an important resource for those who are learning how media works. Tony Schwartz gave his time to teach citizens how to use media for public interest actions. His video produced by David Hoffman, Guerrilla Media, is a valuable guide. There's a concept in communication that goes back to Aristotle that says that persuasion is anthemomatic. What that means is audiences participate in creating the communication. You don't hand a message to someone for maximum impact. You let the audience invest itself in the message, and that co-creative process gives you your highest level of persuasion. Now, Tony hasn't read Aristotle. He hasn't read the communication literature, but he's developed the concept of responsive chord from his experience listening to audiences. The Library of Congress wants Tony Schwartz's complete collection in their archives. I spoke with Tony Schwartz's personal assistant, Forrest Gray, on the nature of Mr. Schwartz's collection. We estimated with the, um, the man from the uh, National Archives um, how long it would take to listen to just the audio recordings of Tony's collection. And we figured out it would be four and a half years if you were listening eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, with no lunch, uh, no bathroom breaks. His impact is still being felt. President George W. Bush's advisor, Karl Rove, had the responsive cord on his recommended reading list. The New York Post, in a column by Dick Morris, linked Bush's media man Mark McKinnoff's wolf ad to the Daisy ad. Tony Schwartz has provided a true key to understanding the 20th century through his work in communications. I think the reason he discovered so many principles in communications is because he didn't go into it with a preconceived notion of what the medium could do, and he would just explore it, he would find the way people react to words and the way he reacts to words by simply paying attention.